Consider supporting Arkea Soup on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Link available in the video description. Hello, Stephanie Wynne Jones. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be on Meet the Archaeologist. Of course. You're welcome. <laughs> now, um, could you possibly just introduce yourself and I suppose your role here at York University? Yes, of course. So I am a senior lecturer here in the archaeology department. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that role, I teach archaeology, of course, at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also, as with everybody here, a research component to my role. Um, and I conduct research in East Africa, okay. um, and particularly on the Swahili coast of East Africa. Right. Now, I'm going to get to that in just a second, because I'm fascinated by that stuff. Uh, it, that, so, by when I say that stuff, I mean that part of your, your bio on the website. Yes. But, uh, I suppose, uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the balance here, then, at the York University Department, between presumably a very strong Roman and medieval, early medieval focus, you know, Romans and Vikings here, and then Africa? Interesting. How, how, how does that work on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, it is quite interesting, um, and I am one of a number of colleagues who work internationally, so we have a very strong mm -hmm. uh, base in British archaeology and I suppose the, the British story okay. um, and this sort of northern European archaeology. Uh, but there's also several of us who work in different parts of the world. Um, Africa has emerged as rather a strong area of research, um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we can integrate that at multiple levels into teaching. I mean, I teach a lot of uh, general courses on aspects of my work which uh, have a more general applicability, perhaps, to some of the areas people are studying anyway. So, mm -hmm. for example, at undergraduate level, I teach courses on Islam and the archaeology of Islam, which, is, which really meshes well with mm -hmm. early medieval archaeology or mm -hmm. um, later medieval archaeology of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I also teach about some of the more practical components of my work. I teach on ceramics and artefacts. Um, I teach on archaeological theory. You know, there are all sorts of places that there's more general archaeology teaching to be done. Okay. Um, and I then uh, build specifically African components in more at the final stages of the degree. So I teach a third year course on the archaeology of Africa. Okay. Um, okay. And I supervise dissertations. Uh -huh. Um, and at postgraduate level, people um, do more specific uh, modules, which might be about Africa. Okay. And of course, I take students to the field. So yeah. some of it is just about having the opportunity to go and dig in an exciting place that might yeah. be a little bit out of the ordinary for them. Okay. So, so, so it sounds as though literally and metaphorically, this, this department offers a quite a crossroads of humanity in that sense. <laughs> yes. I quite like that. Uh, uh, and also as well, the ceramics. I love that there's quite a pile in, in the office at the moment. <laughs> I know, it's, it's I'm brilliant. sorry about uh, that. No, 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 it's magnificent. <laughs> um, so, you're called Wynne Jones, and as a Welsh boy myself, I go, oh, there must be a Welsh connection there <laughs> somewhere in the family. Uh, you clearly have spent some time in Scandinavia, according to your, your career uh, description on, on the university website, but also, obviously, you're, you're an African archaeology specialist. Uh -huh. <laughs> How, you know, explain, how, did that, how does that happen? <laughs> uh, there is a Welsh connection, it's my grandfather, uh -huh, okay. um, but as you can probably hear, I am not from Wales myself, I actually grew up near Cambridge, okay, yeah. um, and I studied uh, in Bristol and in Cambridge, uh -huh. um, and I came to African archaeology really during my time in Cambridge, right. uh, and I worked particularly with um, the archaeologist who became my PhD supervisor, mm -hmm. um, David Philipson, who okay. was uh, director of the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at the time. Um, and he was working on a project from Axum in Ethiopia mm -hmm. um, while I was studying at Cambridge. And I was just amazed by it because I'd, I'd mm -hmm. never really sort of heard of this place, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and I was 
I was intrigued to know more. Um, so I found myself sort of getting deeper and deeper into, into studying um, the archaeology of Africa, which had been something I knew nothing about when I began my degree, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Scandinavian link is later. Okay. Um, and actually, it, uh, I went on a research fellowship during my time here at York. So I, would, I traveled to Uppsala mm -hmm. um, and spent a couple of years there, which was wonderful. Um, and the link is African archaeology. Mm. Uh, African archaeology is quite an international community. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Uppsala is a similar department to York in that they have a very strong Viking and medieval component, European component, but they also have a very strong African archaeology right. um, component. There's several colleagues of mine that work there, and they nominated me for a fellowship to come and work with them for right. a couple of years, which well, was great. That is really great. That's, yeah. that's really cool. Okay, well, that, that, that's that, that's that explained, and that's, that's good to know. So, I, I only recently actually came across some elements of, especially Sub-Saharan and, and Western African archaeology mm -hmm. myself, uh, and I think this is partly because as archaeologists often we're trained, I wouldn't say in a nationalistic sense, but certainly in a local sense. So, mm -hmm. uh, my undergraduate course focused very much on British and Irish archaeology with some international context, this kind of thing. And, and I knew a bit about, for example, uh, the Ethiopian medieval kingdom mm. and the Lalibela churches, this kind of thing. Uh, but, but as you say, Axum is an astonishing place. What, what do you make of, uh, of the, the great pillar, the, the, you know, that, <laughs> that thing that looks like a tower block? What, 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 what do you make of that? Well, it's a funerary monument. Um, and so there's actually, there's several of them. Uh -huh. um, in it's a, the Great Steeler is um, part of a steely park in Axum, mm -hmm. um, where there are many monolithic steely erected over subterranean tombs. Okay. Um, and some of them are still standing and they're actually, they're at the center of the, um, of the modern town of Axum as well. Uh -huh. Everything sort of looks down on this steely part, which is rather wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they were erected over the tombs of kings yeah. slash important um, people uh, within Axumite society. Um, and we don't fully know uh, the, the reasons for that. Mm. Um, but some of the symbolism of the steely suggests that they might have been part of uh, 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 worship of um, the sun, for example. They mm -hmm. have these sort of crescents at the top, mm -hmm. which would have had um, metal discs or um, sort of crescents uh, attached to them, which evoked the sun. Yeah. Um, and we think that this was part of uh, the more general sort of worship of the sun and moon that came to Ethiopia, the sort of pre-Christian tradition in Ethiopia, which came from South Arabia, mm. which mm. was, I mean, to think about directionality is maybe difficult, but mm. but but was was common to that region mm. and South mm. Arabia at the time. Okay, what what drew you to that part of the world? Um, <laughs> I think it was a sequential decision. As, as I, <laughs> I don't okay. think I sat down as an 18 year old and thought well, East Africa is the place how do I get there you mm -hmm. know um, instead I was drawn in over a series of decisions um, that I made and, and part of it was specializing in African archaeology mm -hmm. um, which as I've described was um, partly just about the fact I found I didn't really know very much about it and that was yeah. fascinating to me um, and then partly it was about um, the opportunities that were available to me. Mm. Um, so after I started, after I did a master's um, in African archaeology, um, I went off to do a graduate attachment at the British Institute in Eastern Africa. Right. Um, and so I was sort of naturally drawn to East Africa because yeah. that was where my opportunities were. And then I developed PhD research in the places that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I don't think I'd like to rule out West Africa. <laughs> I think it's really fascinating as well. Yeah. Um, and, and many regions are, I think, regions all around the Indian Ocean world are quite fascinating too. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, I was sort of drawn down this path um, through a series of uh, opportunities and decisions which presented themselves to me, I think. Okay, and so with, with the, the pile of ceramics, uh, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but it is quite a pile. Are you there for a ceramics specialist? Then? 
I, I'm actually not a ceramics specialist, but okay. I have found myself doing a lot of ceramics. I see. I mean, they're so ubiquitous, yeah. and they're often our best source of information on many of the sites of East Africa. Um, and there's a lot still to to understand. In many of the places that I work, we have a very basic culture history, um, but there's a lot still to know in terms of chronological variation, regional variation, mm -hmm. some of the technologies of manufacture, who was making them, where they were getting them from. Mm -hmm. um, and so to answer some of those questions, I have found myself working a lot with ceramics. Okay. Yes. Now, something that, that, that has come out of my uh, my interest, or growing interest in this period, uh, this period and place, sorry, and that is to say medieval Africa, mm -hmm. um, has has been the fact that that in the past research has been somewhat neglected here and there, especially mm -hmm. compared to, for example, you know, the, the 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 near religious chronicling of European events, this kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, I'm not really interested in necessarily talking about about the political angle there and why, but would you say that that that, that there is an increasing desire to do to do catch up to actually maybe translate more documents, get a bit more of a context to. To, to the interconnectivity of, of the medieval world in that sense? I think there definitely is. Mm. I mean, if, if you're talking about the British Academy, yeah. um, there is, there's actually been um, a move of which I've been very aware um, recently towards thinking about the Middle Ages globally yeah. um, mm. and trying to think about uh, some of the developments that we see in Europe in the context of broader connections. Because, mm. the, I mean, the medieval period is this period where people are interconnected on a scale we never saw before no. mm -hmm. and so to try to understand what was going on in other parts of the globe how those places were interconnected or or not or how mm. there were parallel developments in different places mm. um, is a definite trend mm. in contemporary scholarship yes yeah. um, I mean I think there's also uh, a f I don't know whether the archaeology of Africa is neglected so much as the just just not as well known there's not such a long tradition no. um of research on the continent and there's not so many people doing it mm. but there's also this um i think there's often a sense that that our job there is to sketch out a basic culture history for comparison potentially with europe yeah rather than getting into the nitty-gritty as one might uh, in a European context. Mm. So once we know that a Swahili town popped up in the 11th century, that's thought to be the end of the story. Whereas in Europe, we would get into more detail about what was going on there and who they, were, who they were, and, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. and what daily life was like. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you therefore sometimes find yourself having to introduce, for example, students to this broader medieval world as opposed to this like this world of knights and castles and again a very European thing. Yes, mm. all the time. And in fact here I run a course um in the Centre for Medieval Studies at mm. Masters level on the global Middle Ages. Right. Um which is a lot of fun. Uh it's also a challenge. Um I teach with colleagues uh, actually across many disciplines because that's the way the Centre for Medieval Studies works. And um we often find it a challenge to to find the ways that our sources can speak to each other. So the African past we know primarily through archaeology, um, and so then to have a conversation with a literature scholar from, you know, who studies high medieval France is a, an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's a really fun challenge actually for students. Mm. Um, but it's, but yes, definitely that's okay. part of the. Well, job. I, I, have, I have a friend who uh, he's a medieval poetry scholar mm -hmm. in Italy and he's actually about to funnily enough uh, do a year in, in Cambridge uh, researching a poet who's writing in Wales but who's based in northeast of England <laughs> right it's a strange combination of things uh -huh. uh, but it's interesting how even in, in his mind he's, he's he's making all these connections but all those connections are within within that sort of northern European context Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, did you ever find that there are interesting sort of ripples in the other direction? So, for example, the medieval world in Europe arguably is a response to, especially the classical world. I suppose we call it mid Middle Ages because it's between classical and modern, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, in, for example, uh, Ethiopia, you see lots of 
desires and attempts to replicate, for example, Jerusalem and, yes. and, and this kind of thing. What sort of ripples do you see going into Africa from, from the medieval world? What sort of influences? Um, well, I'm not sure they come so much from medieval Europe, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but you see enormous ripples from the medieval Islamic world. Yeah. Um, and particularly, I mean, the the movement is via trade. I mean, there's a the, there's a huge trading network mm -hmm. um, between uh, the East African coast in particular, but but spreading deep into the African continent, um, and the Islamic world centered on the Persian Gulf, but also the Islamic uh, centers in India over into Sindh, um, and those connections are extremely important to some of the ways that uh, that the archaeology is manifest in Africa. Mm. Um, certainly on the Swahili coast um, there was a similar desire to the kind of thing that you're talking about to sort of emphasize these connections with the Islamic heartlands. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's uh, aesthetic, symbolic, it's about um, certain styles that are derived from the Islamic world um, and there's also these oral traditions and histories of uh, kings and rulers who styled themselves as Arabs even though they were not mm. um, but then even sort of further inland away from the coast away from this very conscious sort of um, echoing of Islamic styles um, I suppose that trade had an effect in that it defined some of the luxury goods that were available mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. thus the ways that people um, symbolized elite status and sort of used cloth and beads and mm. the things that became the markers and symbols of power mm. often were coming through those complex networks of trade. So they may not have been aware particularly or interested mm -hmm. <laughs> in their derivation from the Islamic world, um, but those goods still sort of had power mm. through their exotic so, For example, nature. Persian silk, this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Interesting. On the topic of trade, mm -hmm. I, I promised uh, an Egyptology friend, he knows who he is, um, and I'm sure some people can guess, uh, that I would, I would have a punt on a question with you. Okay. Uh, and that question is, where is punt? <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, I'll just put it in context this, the kingdom that's mentioned mm -hmm. especially in, in the ancient Egyptian context lots of trade down into the East African and sort of Saudi peninsula yeah. whereabouts do you think puns might be? <laughs> uh, well I think it's probably an, a, quite a generic term for okay. a broader area mm -hmm. of trade sort of down that coast mm -hmm. um, and it's probably um, along the Red Sea coast of Ethiopia, Eritrea, and down the Somali coast okay. as well. I, I, there is no evidence for the Egyptians having reached particularly far down the East African coast. No. Um, no. But if you can envisage that, the sort of the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea coming mm -hmm. down, um, there, are, there are trading posts like Ras Hafun, um, very early trading posts right on the Horn of Africa and they may have been getting that far down okay. um, but I'm, I'd love to say it was in Tanzania but I, I'm afraid it probably was not. That's fair enough, that's fair enough. <laughs> and, and crucially because as, as soon as I, I started reading about this place or this, this idea of this place I was imagining people sort of in a very Oxbridge way yes, punting, punting. literally punting around <laughs> straw hats but no. Uh, okay well thank you for uh, and thank you for indulging that terrible pun. Uh, <laughs> so uh, on to the questions that I ask every archaeologist in these yes. interviews for the sake of comparison really. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose first of all um, what for you is the most satisfying aspect of being uh, an archaeologist? Well there are many satisfying aspects actually. Okay. Um, I was always interested in history I suppose that's the route by which I came into archaeology mm -hmm. um, and I find it very satisfying to interact with that history in a very material way I'm sure mm -hmm. all archaeologists probably say this mm -hmm. that actually sort of experiencing the past being in the buildings digging up the things that people dealt with on a daily basis mm -hmm. um, is a really wonderful sort of way of understanding it mm -hmm. um, but I suppose in more specifically, the most satisfying thing for me is that I work in a region where we are uncovering pasts that we don't know yeah. and we don't already know. Yeah. And for me, 
that is the most satisfying part and that ultimately is why I was drawn into this region and this work and mm. um, I'm not just digging another Roman villa no offense <laughs> no offense no, 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 no. I, to the Roman villas I, but, I, but you know I'm, I'm digging yeah. up sites where we literally don't know what happened yeah. and um, and that for me is very satisfying work excellent it's uh, I think you're yeah totally uh, the, the moment of interaction with an artifact is often the most ma some of the most magical ones so mm. the first time you see someone's fingerprints in, in pottery or something like that you yeah. just go ah oh, you know something uh, but also, I mean, as much as, as, as you say, you know, Romans are Romans are Romans, mm -hmm. even on a Roman excavation, to be fair, by definition, they're finding something that's new, yes. that hasn't previously been known. And, and in the context of an area where people make less assumptions about what is known, mm -hmm. that must be even more exciting. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, I meant no offence yeah. to Oh, no, 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 not at all. No. Okay, I mean, could... and they should carry on. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Romans can be boring, it's quite well, it's true. Just that, it's not that, it's just that we have this general sense yeah. of the history of that region and, and people, yeah. right? And whereas in East Africa there's the potential for entirely new yeah. knowledge. Absolutely, yeah. I like it. Mm. Yeah, you're, you're on an entirely different call face, I like it. Um, what challenges do you feel mm -hmm. are on the horizon, or indeed present, for archaeology? Well, it depends what kind of archaeology you mean. Okay. Um, I think uh, challenges to university archaeology are complicated and probably mm. more than we can talk about here but um, I think there is a challenge for archaeology as a minority discipline mm -hmm. at, as a university mm -hmm. um, to continue uh, to be seen as um, a, an equivalent degree to something like history the more the sort of bigger majority subjects I think there's a mm. challenge across the university sector actually to some of the minority disciplines because mm. there's this increasing emphasis on you know doing doing some solid subject that will get well, you into and, a graduate scheme you know and, and increasingly and, either it's graduate scheme or, or, or it's being defined like it or not politically as something which, which actually Yes. in a simple way contributes to the to the economy yeah uh, and that i think that's a bit unfortunate yes mm. and i think I, I think it is a bit unfortunate but but i also think there's no reason that archaeology mm. can't be that no. discipline mm. but i um and in fact i think it's an extremely employable discipline in lots of ways yeah. um but i i think it is a challenge for us uh as a minority discipline not to get sort of squeezed out yeah. um, in this current climate. Yeah. Um, challenges so, so to archaeology more generally, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I am not sure, I actually think it's quite a buoyant time for commercial archaeology for example. Um, the jobs sector uh, in commercial archaeology is expanding, there aren't enough archaeologists to fill mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. some of those jobs and it's a, I mean it's a wonderful time in that sense, to be training archaeologists and sending them off into the world, just to yeah. build employment for them. Yeah, well, so it's certainly better than when I graduated, uh, yes. 2008, <laughs> um, 2007, 2008. Okay, uh, but just, just, just to come briefly back t to this idea then of, I suppose, the characterization of archaeology. Mm. Um, it's interesting because archaeologists have far more applicable skills than historians, and yet history is one of the, the, the degrees that, especially if you know, parents will look history, law, you know, Yes. Doctor. Uh, it's interesting how uh, within archaeology th there's the opportunity to be essentially a medical specialist, mm. the opportunity to be an architectural specialist, and all this stuff which lots of. There's cross the opportunity to be essentially an historian if that's yeah. sort of the direction you want to go in. Yeah. I mean, here we have a very strong historical archaeology uh, sort of theme, mm. which, yeah, I mean, you come out with some very similar archival skills yeah. and. and um, analytical skills to a historian. So yes, I know. I mean, actually, I think archaeology is a wonderful degree because, um, in terms of employability, uh, and I should probably mention that I am the careers officer for the department, <laughs> so I think about this a lot, but, okay. um, but because we do sit between humanities and science mm. in a unique way, um, and so graduates leave an archaeology degree with the ability to work with data sets, to use spreadsheets, to deal with numbers and think about um, organising data in mm -hmm. some 
in some useful ways but they also write essays and think about historical themes yeah. and uh, have to develop their analytical skills in that way yeah. so actually you're sort of doing both it's history plus it's history plus yeah <laughs> or biology plus if you want to go the other way absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. and, uh, yeah. and so, well, I suppose an add-on then question would be do you think therefore it's because just, just before off camera we were talking about, about this This is the time of year when lots of students are thinking about their career paths and this kind of yeah. thing. Uh, and I'm not quite sure when this interview will come out, but it will come out probably in September, so it's still that, that time of year. Mm. And do you think therefore it's not only the job of the student to identify, uh, as it were, skills and cross-pollination from one career to their degree and whatever, but also it's possibly the job of increasingly maybe the archaeologists themselves especially in the academic world to maybe try and not just go oh yeah sorry we are as, it, as you say a minority well we're a minority of course yeah. but as you say no actually this is what we do and it, I'm not the same as that person that person you would probably wouldn't even recognize as an archaeologist yeah you know not allow the caricature perhaps uh it depends what you mean by our job I mean I mm. think uh we certainly shouldn't apologize no. um and I think being confident about what we do and why it's a good dis to be in mm. um, is a very good idea. Uh, I mean, we, if you're talking about York specifically, we do work quite hard to try and um, allow students to understand the skills that they have gained from their degree. Yeah. Because I think one of the things that is a challenge, I mean, you know, it's difficult being a graduate and trying to understand how your degree then m maps onto this world of work that yeah. you haven't really experienced before. And understanding the skills that they have gained is not always something that is second nature. So we do mm. try, I mean, we work with the careers department, but we also, within our modules, try to flag up some of the things that yeah. students are gaining, mm. oh, uh, whether it's presentation skills yeah. or analysing data, and we try to work with them to help them understand that. Yeah. Um, but certainly, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it's fully our job to... to focus on that all the time but I don't think we should apologize no and I'm sorry when yeah. I say I suppose what I mean more in terms of the culture as mm. it were, not being an archaeologist yeah in that sense because but I think when it, we it, I think we can just about say that archaeology is no longer a young profession mm -hmm. you know it, we're, we're coming into our stride it's been a good couple of hundred years now yeah. <laughs> and I guess only a good hundred years of, of quasi professionalism and mm -hmm. so yeah, okay, interesting. interesting. <laughs> I like the idea of quasi-professionalism. Quasi-professionalism. Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm a quasi-professional, you know, I, I, I make, make a little gelatinous career. Uh, okay, well, speaking of careers and, and you're, you know, you, you've outed yourself as, as someone who's linked with career advice, mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you give to prospective archaeologists? Not, not only young people who may be wanting to study archaeology, but also maybe just interested uh, amateurs or older people who perhaps just want to dip their toe. What sort of what, what things would you would you recommend? Um, well, I think I think archaeology is an incredibly accessible discipline, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you've summed it up already by saying, you know, there might be people who are considering it for a career, people mm -hmm. who are considering studying it, and some people who just want to go and dig or maybe dress up as an Anglo-Saxon at the weekend. Or <laughs> you know, there's there's a wide world of people wanting to engage with archaeology or the past. Um, I mean, I suppose the only advice I could give to that broader range of people would be just to get involved. Okay. Um, and, but specifically for students or people who are thinking of studying archaeology, um, or for people who are trying to turn it into a career after studying mm -hmm. archaeology, um, I would advise them to stick with it. Okay. Because there are... Uh, with academic archaeology in particular there are challenges mm. I think with any academic career mm. um, and part of those challenges is about figuring out which kind of archaeologist you are and how, mm. how you want to develop that career around archaeology because there are so many ways yeah. um, and so sticking with it and trying things out and um, perhaps sort of you know not giving up if there is a bit of a setback yeah. Um, but I might give that advice to anyone in any career, I suppose. Okay, cool. Yeah. Keep at it. Okay, I like, <laughs> it. I like it. But but also, I think uh, again, as we were just talking off about off camera, I guess there is a need as well to be, and it sounds like you are honest with your students in this mm. department, in so much as it's not it's not always straightforward. It's not an easy thing to do. 
But if you want to do it, you, there are ways to do to become to be an archaeologist. Yes, yeah. there are. Yeah. Uh, not all of them academic. No. no. Yeah, and as I said before, mm. you know, in com the world of commercial archaeology is really changing as well, yeah. and there's a lot of space for specialists as well as you know excavators and mm. surveyors, um, and so there's a lot of scope for different careers there as well. Yeah. So, well yeah. I suppose there's also actually an increasing uh, desire, even within commercial units to approach, for example, public dialogues about archaeology mm. in ever more creative ways. So actually, yeah, I imagine there are, probably, there are probably career paths that we can't quite imagine at the moment that are, <laughs> that are opening up. Interesting. Um, I, I think the future world is full of many career paths that we can't imagine, or that I can't imagine. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Well, uh, before, before I end on like a final question, mm -hmm. um, in the context of, of your, your, your specialism in, in East Africa, is there anything that you wished more people knew about uh, the medieval African world? I, I just wish more people knew that there was a medieval African world. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think, uh, yes, just greater public awareness of the African past um, would be wonderful and it's something that we work towards as African mm -hmm. archaeologists. Okay. Um, I think it would be wonderful if people were aware that there were some very complex uh, civilizations um, within Africa during this period. Um, but I suppose I also would sound a note of caution about um, about everything I've said already about, about the medieval world and how Africa was part of it because I, I also think Africa had its own, had its own, many of its own unique trajectories yeah. to some of these uh, civilizations and mm -hmm. just to sort of bind it into this world or ripples from the Islamic world would be to do it a disservice I think and yeah. so I would love to think that people began to understand the African past on its own terms. Interesting. Okay. And, and so and therefore specifically n not as a, a medieval world that is trying to emulate another rather no, than one that no. has its own identity, its own very much so. Yeah. 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 Um. Yes. And it's it's. I I would say I personally I I can't speak for Africa. Um. <laughs> I I personally have um a, a, a conflicted relationship actually with yeah. medieval as a concept. Yeah. And um, it's been very useful for me and mm -hmm. valuable, and I find it a really interesting conversation to be part of to think about different global medieval societies mm. um, but I'm also aware that by trying but trying to be part of that you're taking a European concept and plunking it onto a continent where it might not yeah. be the most appropriate so uh, and, and indeed precisely because I suppose that relationship between classical and medieval modern Mm. Is essentially a European trajectory. Yes. That's not one that applies, I say, to the Near East or, or, or Africa. No. Direct, in, in such a precise and direct way. No. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. We had Charlemagne, but that doesn't mean that there are other equivalents out there, this kind of thing. It's, yeah. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, what is next for you? What, what, what have you got going on? Anything that people can be looking out for? Uh, well, I have uh, just finished a large excavation project at a site called Songnom Nara okay. in Tanzania uh, and what we were looking at there was uh, daily life essentially on the Swahili coast mm. um, and so we used a wide range of archaeological methodologies to approach uh, sort of 14th 15th century trading settlement um, quite a rich um, and elaborate trading settlement with large mosques and palaces and um, all sorts of wonderful, weird and wonderful archaeology. You know, one of the aspects of Songnam Nara that's always had the most interest beyond the East African world um, has been the coinage, in fact, um, because Songnam Nara is an offshoot of a site called Kilwa Kisiwani, um, which minted its own coins um, from the 11th century onwards. Mm -hmm. um, and they are Islamic coins in that they use Ara the Arabic script yeah. um, and they reference Allah but they're an entirely local tradition and in fact they don't really follow weight standards and so, so things. Is that interesting? This is, this is something that I find fascinating from again a European context mm. is how you end up with coins from uh, I don't know, 
Alexander the Great's father or something, uh -huh. being copied and abstracted and they end up in the Iron Age world and they then hardly yes. even look like the coins at all, but they're just about identifiable as being like a coin. Yes, you exactly. Have, did you have that sort of thing happening um, Yes, I mean, it's. I suppose it's a similar idea, although they are definitely identifiable as being coins. Right. Yeah. Um, it's just that the... And the sizes are actually very standardised, but the weights are very different. So it's like the sort of the idea of the coin yeah. has come, but not the idea that it represents a specific weight of metal yeah. as sort of species standard. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. And that's uh, really interesting. The ways that the, the ways they held value and why they held any value really. These mm. local coins associated with local sultans, the ways they were used. Um, is was, really was, was portraiture important? No, this? so so they're more like um, Islamic coins in that there's no or the later Islamic coins no depictions after of after the reforms yeah. um, where there's no depictions of people. It's it's all script, but the but the script follows a standard. It's a rhyming couplet from obverse to reverse, yeah. um, which is a unique feature of the East African coast. But what's interesting at Sangam Nara is that we found these coins in all sorts of different contexts, including a coin deposit buried in the foundations of a house. Mm -hmm. And in that same context, in other houses, we found different types of object. So we can think about those other objects as being equivalent to coins in that they were probably stores of value deposited in the foundations. And one of my favourites um, is the is a deposit of a whole series of Aragonite beads, enormous beads, yeah. um, these big sort of discs, and they're cut from the shells of giant clams, okay. um, which would have meant people diving down onto the coral reef, lifting enormous clams. Mm -hmm. They're worked using a lithic technology, they're, they're um, shaped into these sort of disc beads, and they're huge, they wouldn't have been worn. Um, so they presumably were another sort of marker of value mm. I don't know if they were traded or used as currency but they certainly performed in the context of a deposit a similar function to a coin yeah. um, and they are fully local they're, they're specific to the Kilwa region so could, could they be compared to say gold bullion which hasn't really got a a day-to-day -day purpose and trade, but yeah, represents an ultimate statement of value, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah. Although Kilwa had a lot of gold bullion too. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, that was yeah. what Kilwa's trade was built on, and, yeah. but we don't see any of that. They were <laughs> <No>. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's because it doesn't hang around long. No, okay. Mm. Uh, one final question then. Um, I've just been intrigued then uh, by these coins. Presumably they didn't toss coins heads and tails. Do you know what, 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 what the saying might be? Would it be like rhyme or...? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> if it's rhyming couplets, yeah. yeah. First or rhyme, yeah, go on. I mean, yeah, interesting. I guess one side has the name of uh, the sultan. We call them sultans, although they may not have been. And, and the, the other side has a, a phrase extolling his virtues. So... No, it would have so to be king and virtue. It would have to be king and virtue. Yeah, king of virtue. <laughs> king. Interesting. Okay. And uh, as I said, I've just finished, and I'm writing it up as a monograph. Okay. Wow. Oh, I sh it's what I should be doing as it, we speak. That's, that's and an then, unusually fast turnaround. Isn't it? <laughs> well, I say we just finished. Our last excavation season was in 2016, okay. so we've sort of finished the analysis now, and now we really need to buckle down and write. Wonderful. Cool. Yes. One last thing then, just just from a, a, a logistics standpoint, mm -hmm. what 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 does that mean then? Do excavate? I mean, I, I know that Egyptologists and others excavate in faraway places as well, but logistically, how difficult is it to get material, say, from Tanzania to York to study? Uh, well, a lot of the material was studied in Tanzania. Okay. Yeah. Um, it actually wasn't. It's surprisingly straightforward actually to mm -hmm. export archaeological materials and so the ceramics um, and some of the metalwork and coins we did bring back. Mm -hmm. um, all the fauna and the bones were all analysed in situ yeah. um, and so a, a lot of the bulkier stuff stayed um, right. in Tanzania but, but yes actually we brought a lot of stuff back just using excess baggage. It turned right. out to be the best way so all this whole team was sort of coming back with six suitcases and yeah. paying a fortune to British Airways. Uh -huh. um, one, one memorable season I did come through Heathrow with six suitcases of soil 
oh, wow. um, which I was trying to sort of keep on this luggage trolley, you know, and yeah, I could yeah. barely move. Yeah. But um, but yes, we did a lot of it by hand. The, the logistics of getting permits to export and things were very straightforward. Okay. And we have a good relationship with the Department of Antiquities. Excellent. And I suppose the, the reason why I ask is I kind of had a sense of that already. Mm. But, but uh, it's, it, it's interesting how. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that people often, I often get asked about, but I, I'm not really qualified to answer, is that mm -hmm. I, I don't excavate abroad. So that's, that's an interesting one. And, yeah. and I suppose just briefly then, what's, what, uh, what's the ultimate destination of that material? Does it really end up it will going all back go again? back, yeah. although, yeah. although that is challenging um, in Tanzania because the Department of Antiquities is part of the government, they're part of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Tourism mm -hmm. um, and they are moved around quite a lot as the government offices move around so storage mm -hmm. at the Antiquities Division is always at a premium so um, we will return everything once we've published mm -hmm. um, but it's an ongoing conversation with Antiquities about how it will be stored and ultimately uh, the responsibility is normally on the researcher yeah. to provide storage space, shelving and mm -hmm. you know just some and the, even the boxes and you know just the yeah. adequate environment yeah. for storage. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And there we go.